First, we heard about the camps. Hundreds of thousands of people locked up and fed propaganda. Then came stories of torture and abuse, forced labor and coercive birth control. The very first thing that people can do and governments and bodies can do is to actually call the child by its name. Beijing calls these vocational training centers. They're an education center. It's for help the people who have been brainwashed by extremists. A legal claim sent to the International Criminal Court describes things differently. Uh, we are alleging, based on, on the evidence which requires further investigation, uh, crimes of genocide and crimes against humanity. The lawyers say they'll be relying on a significant body of evidence, including documents recently uncovered and witness testimony from people who have personal, first-hand experience of the repressive regime imposed in Xinjiang and, crucially, who've made it out to tell their stories. Zumra Dawut is one of those people. Now safe in the United States, her story begins in early 2018 when she was summoned to the local police station in Xinjiang. After questioning, she was taken to a detention center. When the Chinese government took our BBC colleagues on a rare tour last year, they wanted to show a happy place where Uyghurs and other Muslim minorities are de-radicalized and learn job and language skills. But people who've been inside paint a very different picture. A relentless routine of propaganda lectures on the dangers of Islam and the values of the party. Guards meeting out harsh punishments to those who break the rules. <laughs> Every two weeks, Zumrat says, the women were given an injection. Every day, they were forced to take a pill. Substances unknown. <laughs> Access to Xinjiang is tightly controlled. Communication with outsiders closely monitored. So we don't know exactly how many people have been held in these camps. Researchers estimate the number is likely over a million. The latest information, which appears to be corroborated by footage collected by activists, suggests many are being sent from the re-education camps to work in factories. A lot of people have been released into coercive labor, especially from the so-called vocational training camps. Those have been put into uh, factories often industrial parks that are heavily secured and guarded. At the same time, however, it's clear that a large number of especially uh, the more intellectual uh, elite uh, academics, artists, musicians have been sentenced to long prison terms. So they are they're kind of being um, put aside, they're out of the way so that Beijing can uh, coercively re-engineer Uyghur society. Zumrat Dawood was released after two months, but there was worse to come. 
Because she'd exceeded China's two-child policy, she was made to pay a fine. Then she said they told her she'd been selected to undergo a sterilization procedure, free of charge. She was horrified. Zumrat was taken to a clinic and given a general anaesthetic. When she came round, she found herself on a ward together with other women. Zumrat's experience is not an isolated incident. New research published last month suggests women in Xinjiang are being forced to be sterilized or fitted with contraceptive devices on a large scale. It's a birth prevention scheme, um, which relies on three pillars, I would argue. Firstly, on draconian punishments, uh, notably internment for those who violate birth control policies. Secondly, for a mass program of inserting intrauterine devices into women. And thirdly, a program of mass sterilization for which we have specific target figures for two Uyghur counties which in 2019 plan to sterilize between 14 and 34 percent of all women of reproductive age. The researchers uncovered documents that appear to corroborate Zumrat's allegation that people are being threatened with internment if they don't submit to sterilization. These aren't secret documents. They're publicly available, archived on local government websites. I mean, here's one from May 2018 that says that women who exceed birth quotas must adopt birth control measures with long-term effectiveness and, quote, be subjected to vocational skills, education and training. That same euphemism that Chinese officials always use to refer to the re-education camps. China has called the allegations in the report baseless, but the documentary evidence and witness testimony from Zumrat and others will be used to try to persuade the prosecutor at the ICC to investigate and potentially charge senior Chinese officials. The policy doesn't start um, with the, 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 the camp guards. It, it's coming from the top down. That, that is the direction that it's following. And we are using the well-established principles of command and superior responsibility that the ICC has relied upon, that was also drawn upon at the Yugoslav Tribunal and going right back to the Nuremberg and Tokyo tr Tribunals. There is a problem here in that China is not a signatory to the Rome Statute. It's not signed up to the ICC. But the lawyers in this case are arguing that some of the alleged victims were forcibly brought back to China from other countries that are signatories, and therefore the International Criminal Court does have jurisdiction here. After the operation, Zumbrat and her family managed to flee Xinjiang to the United States, where she spoke publicly at the United Nations about her experiences, a decision she feared could have repercussions back home. <laughs> Not long after, a neighbor sent her some footage of a funeral. Her father had passed away. State media in China has denied he was ever detained by police. They say he died of a long-term heart condition. <laughs> Korktum, 
Uyghurs face devastating choices, whether in exile or at home, and in the face of perhaps the most powerful state on earth, the search for justice at the ICC is a long shot. <laughs>